we're going to go, we're going to begin with a poem that's called uh, "Welcoming the Flowers." I'm standing on the corner of Stanton and Christie, waiting for the traffic light to change. A man is sitting on the steps of a building, holding his young son on his lap. He is eating fried chicken from Chico's takeout on Houston. He chews on the wings and feeds bits of the breast to his son. The man finishes eating, puts the leftover chicken and bones, fries and soda can in a paper bag and leaves it on the sidewalk. A brown dog from the neighboring building snoops around, gets its nose in the bag, chews on the bones, and makes a mess. A black cat sitting in a window watches wide-eyed, staring down at the dog, chicken bones, and grizzly. Thank <laughs> you. 
kangaroos, the poppies, pockets, with not Possible. 
and trying to be safe. In a situation where you must abandon yourself beyond all concepts. Just say no to family values. We don't gotta say no to family values. We never think about them. Just do it. Just make love and uh, compassion. And the next is a couple of excerpts from a very long memoir piece that's called The Death of William Burroughs. William died on August 2nd, 1997, Saturday at 6.30 in the afternoon from complications from a massive heart attack he'd had the day before. He was 83 years old. I was with William Burroughs when he died, and it was one of the best times I ever had with him. Doing Tibetan Buddhist Nima meditation practice, I absorbed his consciousness into my heart. It seemed like a bright white light blinding but muted. I was the vehicle, his consciousness passing through me. A gentle shooting star came in my heart and up the central channel and out the top of my head to a pure field of great clarity and bliss. It was very powerful. William Burroughs resting in great equanimity and the vast empty expanse of primordial wisdom of mind. I was staying in William's house, doing my meditation practices for him, trying to maintain the good conditions and dissolve any obstacles that might be arising for him at that very moment in the bardo. I had confidence that William had a high degree of realization, but he was not totally, not completely an enlightened being. Lazy, alcoholic, junkie William. I did not let doubt to arise in my mind even for an instant because it would have allowed doubt to arise in William's mind. Now I had to do it for him. This is a long piece of it. Skip to another part that's called What Went In to William Burroughs' Coffin with His Dead Body. On August, on Tuesday morning, August 6th, 1997, James Darrell Holtz and Ira Silverberg came to William's house to pick out the clothes for the funeral director to put on William's dead body. The clothes were in a closet in my room, and we picked out the things that would go into William's coffin and grave, accompanying him on his journey in the underworld. His favorite gun, a 38 snub nose special, fully loaded with five shots. William called it the snub. The gun was my idea. William always said, it can never be too well armed in any situation. Of his more than 80 world-class guns, he often wore it on his belt during the day and slept with it, fully loaded on his right side under the bed sheet every night for 15 years. His favorite cane, a sword cane, made of hickory. Rafe 
fedora. He always wore a hat when he went out, and we wanted his consciousness to feel at ease dead. Sporcher, dark black with a dark green tint. We rummaged through his closet, and it was the best of his shabby clothes and smelling sweet of Blue jeans, the least worn ones were the only ones clean. Red bandana, he often kept one in a back pocket. Jockey underwear and socks, black shoes, the ones he wore when he performed. I thought he wore brown ones that he wore every day because they were more comfortable. But James Grauholz insisted there's an old CIA slang that says getting a new assignment is getting new shoes. White shirt. We bought it in a men's shop in Beverly Hills in 1981 on the Red Night Tour. It was his best shirt. All the others were a bit ragged. And even though it had become tight, it lost a lot of weight and we thought it would fit. Necktie, blue, hand painted by blue. Moroccan vest, green velvet with a gold brocade trim, given him by Brian Dyson 25 years before. In his lapel button, the rosette of the French government's commandant, or they are there, and the rosette of the American Academy of Arts.
And his next one is called, It Doesn't Get Better. It doesn't get better. It doesn't get better. It doesn't get any better. It doesn't get any more fabulous than this. And as bad as it is, it does not get any better. Stuck in a traffic jam, and the scenery is beautiful, irritating gusts of boredom, and on the radio is playing. If you don't like my oceans, don't swim in my seas. You can't hurt me, cause storms can't hurt the sky. Sugar skulls and long necklaces of rotting human skulls of police officers, lawyers, and judges. The triumph over abuse and injustice. Fat chance, wind alone. I could not save you. You are addicted to anger and complaint. When you got hepatitis, everything looks yellow. My anger ate the goose that laid the golden egg. Thick bacon and a little something sweet. And the most surprising change is being the god of your enemy. The eagles fly below us. The illusion that makes life bearable, the illusion that makes life bearable, the illusion that makes life bearable, when you lose the illusion that makes life bearable, when you lose the illusion that makes life bearable, when you've lost whatever it is, you believe or invented, or invented or scarred by unthinkable loss, deluded inside delusion, inside delusion, inside delusion. Everything is delusion, including the wisdom. And then there's the illusion that makes life bearable, the illusion that makes life bearable, the illusion that makes life bearable. I'm here to do whatever is your pleasure. Empty words gone without a trace. All I had to do was get through it. All I had to do was get through it. All I had to do was get through it. You can't win. You can't break even. And you can't even quit the game. The sand is snow, a hurricane in a drop of cum. You will find your true love in the end. You will find your true love in the end. You will find your true love in the end. When you die, you will find your true love in your mind. When you die, you will find your true mind. In the darkest night is the brightest light. Clear, unlocated, emptiness awareness.
started writing in July of 2001 in New York City and finished it at the end of that year, 2001. And it's, and it's called, There Was a Bad Tree. There was a bad tree, a bad tree that people hated. The leaves gave off a foul smell and the flowers had a bitter stink. If you got too close, you vomited. The fruit was poison. One bite and you were dead. Everyone really disliked it. The bad tree stunk. They talked endlessly about it and decided to cut it down. Get rid of it. They chopped with axes and barely made a dent. Wearing breathing masks, they whacked at it and whacked at it and nibbled and chipped. Oily powder from the shiny dark green leaves got on their skin, blistered and was really itchy and they scratched bloody red. They put on protective gear with oxygen and went at it with electric buzz saws and heavy equipment. Working 24 hour shifts, finally they cut it down. Everyone was very happy and celebrated the great victory, a noble deed, well done, and they went to bed exhausted. The next morning, the bad tree had grown back, had sprung up new and bigger and more beautiful and ugly. It was very discouraging. They talked a lot about it and cut it down again and poured gasoline on the roots and burned all the leaves and branches in a big fire. After the smoldering embers got cold, the tree grew back, bigger, more bad, and really gorgeous. Other people had been watching from their houses, waiting their turn. They thought of themselves as smarter, with higher intellectual capabilities. They knew how to get rid of the tree. It was a growing plant, a wood tree that grew in the earth. They incinerated it, burned the roots with chemicals, vaporizing acids, and robotic lasers. Detonated on the ground, bombed from the air, hit with smart missiles, and bombarded with radiation. They made a fire storm and covered the ground with concrete and steel. The tree grew back more fresh, more elegant and gracious and really ugly. The leaves were full lush like underwater plants floating in the breeze. And the wood was thick, hard wood. They had created for themselves a, a they had created for themselves a catastrophe, a hell. They ate the leaves and enjoyed 
their faces into the stinking slime and really got into it, inhaling with their lips and teeth and tongues. They licked and drank the thick red juice. The seeds, like little shot rubies, seemed particularly potent and were chewed with great delight. The fruit contained the five wisdoms. The men and women became luminous. Their skin was golden and their bodies, almost transparent, were filled with luminous light. They became sleepy, yawned, and curled up under the tree and took a nap. While they slept, music fell into the air. Lounging against the gnarled tree trunk and protruding roots, their huge bodies, colored red, yellow, blue, green, white, rested in great equanimity and radiated huge compassion. Inside the tree was the secret home of many demigods, hungry ghosts, and earth spirits who were very pleased with all the positive attention being paid them. After years of abuse, mutilation, and destruction, they were thrilled even though they were being ravaged and their flowers wrecked. At the root endings, there were jewels, diamonds, and emeralds, and rubies, which were stars in the sky of the world below. The beautiful men and women woke up and nibbled on the leaves again. They ate the leaves like deer, pausing between bites, looking up at the vast, empty sky. The leaves and fruit increased their clarity and bliss and introduced the nature of primordially pure wisdom of mind. on my 70th birthday in December of 2006. Thanks for nothing on my 70th birthday. I want to give my thanks to everyone for everything. And as a token of my appreciation, I want to offer back to you all my good and bad habits as magnificent, priceless jewels wish-fulfilling gems, satisfying your every need and want. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thanks. May every drug I ever took come back and get you high. May every glass of wine and vodka I ever drank come back and make you feel really good, numbing your nerves, allowing the natural clarity of your mind to flow through. May all the suicides be songs of aspiration. Thanks that bad news is always true. May all the chalk of every come back rushing through your bloodstream and make you feel happy. Thanks for allowing me to be a poet, a noble effort, beautiful, but the only choice.
celebrating me. Thanks for the resounding applause. Thanks for taking everything for yourself and giving nothing back. Only self-serving. Thanks for exploiting my big ego and making me a star.
moved again and became a core, and quartz moved again and again and became protons and neutrons and the twelve I did it. 